This is Heart Rhythm TV. I'm Clinton Thurber. Here with Dr. Ellen Bogan, who's joining us for our Fellows in Focus series. Really needs no introduction, of course, to the, uh, an audience of EPs. But just to be uh, thorough and, and brief, he is a uh, professor of cardiology at VCU in Richmond, Virginia, and currently leads the EP division over there. Obviously, he's authored hundreds of publications, book chapters, served on editorial boards and guideline writing committees, and notably has contributed uh, arguably our greatest device textbook to our field that everyone benefits from and studies on a regular basis. And on a personal note, is the leader of the EP division at the institution where I first became interested in electrophysiology. So I always think of uh, VCU fondly that way. Dr. Ellen Bogan, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Clinton. Yep. So this series focuses uh, on, on fellows, and, and being July right now, we have a number of, of new fellows that have come into the field. Many of us have really not seen pacemakers or defibrillators other than what they look like now. Can you take us back to earlier days of pacing and defibrillation and tell us kind of what that looked like? Sure, I'll be glad to. It, it's really quite interesting. In the early days, many, in fact, the vast majority of institutions, surgeons implanted pacemakers. Oh, wow. And it wasn't that they were so big. They were, um, pacemakers were about half the size of what a defibrillator looks like today. So they were pretty substantial uh, pieces of a metal going into a patient's chest and the incisions were quite a, quite a bit wider than we, we mm. imagine today. But it was felt that cardiologists couldn't possibly have the skills to make an incision, to make a pocket, to sew a pocket closed. And when I was a fellow, we actually trained in uh, implantation. And we were trained with just the most rigorous skills, uh, you know, how to make this, how to prep and drape and make the incision, with a real focus on appropriate and proper technique. When I got to my institution, basically the cardiac surgeons were implanting pacemakers, and they would have none of it. Their excuse was, "Well, what happens if you have a perforation? You won't know what to do." So what happened is we actually had a cardiac surgeon at our place implant a pacing lead in the left ventricle, in the aorta. Oh, no. Patient had a stroke, and then they said, oh, my gosh, the pacemaker's in the arterial circulation, not the venous circulation. And it was on that that I began implanting pacemakers, initially at the VA, then at the University and Medical Center. And even early on, in the early days of implantation, many uh, folks in EP, because EP had not started... Uh, being ablation. So it was mostly diagnosis, put catheters up, make a diagnosis, and then put people on medicines or send them to surgery. Oh, uh, yeah. In the, it's really quite amazing. So in those days, a lot of, e, I, I tried to train some of the EP people who were there before me, so they were older than I, and they were like, why would I want to put a pacemaker in? <laughs> I don't want to put a pacemaker in. Then I'd have to follow the patient. I yeah, want to do so any, I have to do anything <laughs> with that. And they actually didn't even see that patients who get implantable devices are the patients we take care of. They have arrhythmias, they have AFib, they have VT, whatever. Um, when, and I trained at Hopkins as a house officer, and in those days when I was training, putting a defibrillator in involved a median sternotomy or a chest incision. Wow. And they came back from the OR with multiple tubes, and they were in the ICU, coronary ICU. I took care of them. In those days, the beginning days, patients had one or two arrests to get a defibrillator. Wow. When we started putting defibrillators in, people fought to get a slot to get trained to put a defibrillator in. In the very beginning, and for a number of years, I can't remember, five, six, seven years, it was a team approach. You had to be trained. You had to go up to St. Paul, Minneapolis, and you had to go with your surgeon. And the surgeon got trained. He learned how to do a sub xiphoid approach or thoracotomy, whatever, median sternotomy, and how to put the patches on the heart and how to put the epicardial sensing leads in. And that's how it was done. And you were there merely to check DFTs. That was your job. Um, <laughs> and we, we fought for positions in order that we could get defibrillators. When you started putting defibrillators in, when I started putting defibrillators in with our surgeon, the thing was, you had to order a defibrillator ahead of time, like a week, two weeks, and you ordered it with a certain rate cutoff. So I need a defibrillator mm -hmm. 
with a rate cut off 180 beats a minute. Pre okay, preset. it'll be two weeks. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And in the late 1990s, we were very early adop adopters of transvenous defibrillators, very okay. early on. They were, well, first of all, they were huge devices, you know, placed up here. Before that, the surgeons would put them in and the devices were so big, transvenous, but the device was, I don't know, a pound and a half, only could be put abdominally. So they would tunnel it oh. from an incision here all the way down to a pocket above the rectus muscle. And they did in the OR because, you know, they had a big, long tunneling tool. Yeah, and in yeah. those days, it sort of felt like that may be a bit much. Primitive. Yeah. Primitive. But after that, when they got a little bit smaller with, you know, biphasic shocks, um, and uh, the Medtronic came out with a smaller defibrillator, we started putting them in transvenously, just like pacemakers, mm -hmm. and the volume just sort of took off because it was something you could do. It wasn't OR, it wasn't general anesthesia. We actually used conscious sedation. We never got anesthesiologists. And, and the field has changed so much since then. Well, wow, that's amazing history. I don't think we have all appreciated that, um, you know, with the tiny devices we have now. Um, we touched on the obstacles a little bit that the pacing and defibrillation has faced along the way. Maybe a brief word on, on where you think the future is. We've, we've heard just at this meeting about conduction system pacing. We've heard CRT in a wireless fashion, um, some artificial intelligence talks. How do, how do you see it going from here? Well, I think there is so much innovation in this field. I remember 30 years ago, somebody coming in my office and trying to convince me to be involved in a clinical trial of the first pacemaker that had rate response. Mm. So can you imagine before that, you had a pacemaker, your program is VVI, 60, 70, 80 beats a minute. He said, this is a rate adaptive pacemaker, uses a accelerometer. I don't think it was an accelerometer then, it was a piezoelectric crystal glued to the can. And <laughs> he said, this is gonna be the last development, last breakthrough in pacing. This is it, you've <laughs> gotta do it. This is gonna, and every time someone says that to me, it's always, what's next so yeah. you know who would have thought there'd be a subcutaneous defibrillator and now there's other there's another uh defibrillator that's being developed that doesn't a leadless defibrillator and leadless mm. pacemakers we have ones that can sense the a pace the v yep. pretty soon we'll have leadless in the atrium maybe in the lv not too long i think what we'd like to s and and conduction system pacing is clearly the most physiologic pacing. So I anticipate some combination of all that, of leaveless and getting into the conduction system and smaller and, you know, I think it's, I think the circuitry, battery, maybe even rechargeable, but it's gonna be an exciting future. Yeah, that's neat. I think we often think of uh, complex ablation as kind of the frontier, but uh, the device side has just as much to offer and arguably could, you know, give us even more advancements. So, Dr. Ellen Bogan, thanks for joining us here on Fellows in Focus, Heart Rhythm TV. Thanks. <laughs>